Stolen Education is the story of a small town of Driscoll, Texas, told by Enrique Alamán of his mother, Lupe Alamán, who never spoke about the discrimination that her hometown put upon the small farming community's children of Driscoll. In 1954, Brown v. Board of Education, the U.S. Supreme Court outlawed school segregation, forcing school districts to close Mexican and Black schools. All the students were placed in the same building, but discrimination still remained. Rather than meet the letter of the law, local school boards across the country rejected the court's mandate and developed alternative methods for denying equal educational opportunities. All of the schools in the towns were still segregated. The district was placing students with Spanish surnames into three years of first grade, called beginners, low first, and high first. The classes were based on racial identity and the children were never tested for academic ability or English proficiency. In 1956, eight student families, including Lupe Alamán, sued the district, of, the school district of Driscoll for discrimination and changed the face of education in the Southwest. It seemed the school board was aware that the families were upset, but it decided it was the way it was down in South Texas. The town needed labor, and the consequence was to have to teach the children. The children were punished for speaking Spanish and would be disciplined if caught. They were losing their culture and their language because of the segregation. Attorney James DeAnda sued the school district. His strategy was to place all of the children on the stand to prove their English proficiency and that the children did not need to go to first grade three times. This lawsuit could have happened anywhere in South Texas at the time. Norma Guzman from Texas A&M University Kingsville mentions the problem of overrepresentation of Hispanic students in special education programs. A quote from the film states, If both the children who do and the children who do not speak and understand the English language upon first entering school are required to be placed in the same classroom, all of such children are retarded. This quote shows that some schools do not consider bilingual or any non-English speaking students to be, quote, normal. This leads to the students being separated into different classes, which deprives minority students of a proper education. In the readings by Ferguson, Susan Wendell discusses the pace of life. This is a factor in the social construction of disability. Wendell states, when the pace of life in a society increases, there is a tendency for more people to become disabled, not only because of physically damaging consequences of efforts to go faster, but also because fewer people can meet expectations of, quote, normal performance. Thus, disability is socially constructed through the failure or unwillingness to create ability among people who do not fit the physical and mental profile of, quote, paradigm citizens. These quotes discuss students who are being thrown into a fast-paced learning environment but are not given the proper materials to succeed. This type of situation occurs with minority students that are still adjusting to quote normal school expectations. A large portion of this film discusses social class and what it looked like in the Driscoll community. Dr. Norma E. Cantu talks about the level of oppression at the time and the way it correlated with social class. Can't you mention that the general idea was that Hispanics in the community were primarily viewed as laborers? She talked about the way white families would attempt to excuse the racial divide in labor by referring to their housemaids that were Hispanic women as family. Many of the Hispanics during this time had to drop out of school to support their families financially. Without having education, it was more difficult for these students to obtain well-paying jobs. Most of the time, they would resort to low-condition work such as picking cotton. This relates to what Ferguson says about exploitation, which is one of the five faces of oppression. Ferguson explains that labor is a product of defining class, where there are ideologies of natural superiority and inferiority. Cantu also shared that there were no universities for them to attend, thus meaning there was a lack of resources for the Hispanic community. She went on to say that 84% of Hispanics in just school did not attend high school or receive their diploma. The school statistics stated that 80% of their students were classified as at-risk students because they were economically disadvantaged. Gender is a large factor throughout this film as well. Something that stood out particularly to me in this area was that every single member on the school board for Driscoll was a male. This made me wonder if it had any possible connection to the way the system had been divided as well as the case process. Ferguson mentions gender and reproductive labor and that males benefit from the idea that they contribute less at home and within domestic labor. Instead, they normally focus on paid employment and tend to dominate in that area of society more so than women. 
One major theme that is discussed in Stolen Education is race and how Mexican Americans were discriminated against for not being able to speak English. Laura Munoz discusses how parents stopped teaching their children Spanish as their first language. They were scared that their children would not be accepted in society due to their experiences. Teachers at schools didn't want to accommodate the needs of these learners, so they decided that students would have to conform to learn in English only. In Ferguson, she discusses how public officials wanted Mexican children in schools, but segregated so these students could be controlled and Americanized. This is one of the inequalities among Mexican-American students, because they are not able to have their culture appropriately represented, and the Spanish language is seen as inferior to the English language. This also connects to Sonia Nieto's Moving Beyond Tolerance article, where she discusses the difference between tolerance and acceptance. In a tolerance school, ESL teachers do not have to speak Spanish, and students are only taught to use their native language as a last resort. In an accepting school, there is a diverse staff where teachers can speak English and Spanish, and the student's culture is represented in the curriculum. In Stolen Education, we see the importance of encouraging diversity and acceptance in the classroom and all environments to support the student's success. Dr. Norma E. Gantu from the University of Texas at San Antonio discusses the importance of the Driscoll case since it changed education in Texas. She expresses how she can't believe the case is forgotten about and how it should be a high-profile case because of its impact. Bell mentions in her article the importance of resistant stories when we teach our students about racism through the process of storytelling. These stories allow us to hear about the hardships and struggles that different groups of people have had to face. However, most often these stories have not been mentioned in our history books or in the curriculum because they mainly involve people of minority groups. This goes to show how parts of history aren't talked about as much as they should be because it's different, beneficial, or directly affect white people. In Ferguson, she mentions how social situations affect everyone differently based on race, gender, and class of people involved. White students would be able to continue on with their education regardless of the Driscoll case because being passed or not. However, for Mexican students, this prevented them from being discriminated against in schools and allowed them to continue on to have the same education as their peers. It is essential that we teach cases like this in our schools in order to inform our students of the racism that exists in society and what steps are taking to change the status quo.